we're online uh, compared to seeing your faces face to face. Um, but I'm Matt, I'm a, a COO and I'll tell you what that means very shortly. Hopefully you can see a blue screen with my presentation on. So I'm going to join today by our, our art and animation producer, Natalie, and our QA lead uh, on the match AI, um, CJ Ransom. So they'll each introduce themselves and talk about what they do and some suggestions about how if you wanted to do what they do. So I'm hoping that most people who are on on today uh, actually enjoy and play video games. And there aren't many adults uh, that will tell you that's a good thing, but I, I think it's a great thing. Uh, I've grown up with games and I've had a, a career with games. Uh, it's a really amazing industry. Uh, it's, it's actually very professional, very technical. Um, and it's a serious business uh, and, and working in the games industry is a good thing. Um, so the first thing to say is that the games industry is very, very big. And even in the UK, it's a five billion pound plus uh, size of business of which nearly four billion is in game software. So it's a big business. There's a lot of money in it. And when there's a lot of money in it, that means that there's opportunities uh, for companies to thrive and to hire uh, and to grow. So in the global picture, the UK is actually number three market for making games. Um, and we're really lucky in the UK. We have a lot of reasons why this country in particular um, is very good at making games. Um, and it, I can hear some laughing. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping that's that's because you can't believe your luck that we can be in in this sort of an industry. Um, it, it's a very creative industry and unlike many other jobs out there, it often combines uh, very complex problems. Uh, it brings together very clever people to solve uh, new, new ways of doing technology. And importantly, it combines the arts uh, and the sciences. And it's not just the 3D art that, that Natalie will probably talk about, um, but it's also, um, dialogue, narrative, scripting, um, it's performance and, and setting up those sides of things. So uh, really open opens up a lot of opportunities for people who may not have thought about it. Now, I hope everyone out there has got a pen and paper to hand or a little digital notebook. But if you jot down this website and it will come up later in the presentation, this is the trade body for the games industry in the UK. And there's a lot of resources on there. So uh, who am I and why am I here? Well, I work for a company called Sports Interactive. It's a games company that's been around for uh, almost 30 years now, um, close on. And we make a particular product called Football Manager. And before that, that was called Championship Manager. Uh, the game itself, uh, the studio itself was founded by the two gentlemen in the middle here. That's Ov and Paul. They were teenagers and they made a game um, from their bedroom, literally, uh, in the late 80s uh, because there wasn't a game like theirs and they wanted to play the type of game that they wanted to make. So they made it. Um, my boss is the guy with the Watford shirt slightly to the right. His name's Miles Jacobson. He made his um, career, first career in the music industry. Uh, he signed up bands and so on, but he loved playing games. And he swapped uh, an early build of Championship Manager for a pair of concert tickets, and the rest is history. He started in the QA department initially, and he worked himself up to run the business. And we were acquired, which means that our studio was bought by Sega, the big Japanese games corporation, back in 2006. This is what we make. It's an annually iterated product uh, and making an annual product is hard. Um, it means you've always got a deadline. There's always a lot to do, um, but it does mean that you get to polish and perfect a product and make it better year after year. And for those of you who don't know Football Manager, it's a very detailed uh, game that puts you in the role of the manager. Uh, and basically, you can make all the decisions about who, who gets trained, who gets hired, who gets fired. Uh, and you chance your, your skills and your decisions in a simulated world of football. Um, we're most famous for being on the PC, 
but we're actually on all formats. So we have um, developers in the studio who are specific to say an Xbox or uh, the Google Stadia, which is a new streaming platform or on the mobile uh, platforms as well. So, uh, and then we have team members who work across all of those platforms. So this is the studio and what we make. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself just to give you some context. So this was me when I started in the games industry. Uh, if I came off screen now, you'll see I've got very gray hair. So that's what the games industry does to you. Um, I am a normal person. I grew up in South London. Uh, I went to school, I got married, I've got kids. Um, and uh, when I started work, or I, when I did school, I, I wasn't the best student initially. I, I had average uh, scores at school, but I got turned on to learning. I was very curious. And when I went to university, I found something I was really interested in, which was geography. Not particularly useful for my job, um, but, but very enjoyable. And when I left uh, school and I went to work in the real world, I went to night school. I spent the first year doing three nights a week uh, trying to learn uh, marketing. Um, and really, since I left school, I have never stopped learning. There's always something to learn about. Um, but now I sort of orientate it towards, towards the work that I do. Um, my first jobs were in children's books. I started at the very bottom. Um, I also worked for a council. I worked in their leisure services department, so in their sports facilities uh, on the marketing side. And I was very lucky. I ended up in games almost by accident. And um, once you get into games, it's such a good industry. I'm glad I never left. So I've been working in the games industry about 25 years. These are some of the games that I've worked on. Um, hopefully you'll know some of them, uh, like the Lego series um, or some of the film titles. Rollercoaster Tycoon is still relatively big. Worms is still big. Um, and, you know, I was very lucky. I was able to work on first person shooters or racing games. And I worked a very long time at the Walt Disney Company. And there I got to work on some very cool properties, um, both in mobile or online through Facebook and so on. So I've seen a lot of games and that's helped me get the job that I have now, which is called a COO. So what is a COO? It's a chief operating officer. So what is that? Um, basically the job entails a couple of things, but the most important thing I do is I look after my boss. My boss is a very creative person. He likes to be imaginative. He likes to make things happen that seem pretty impossible. And he doesn't like what he calls the boring stuff. And my job is to pick up all the boring stuff that will make us very successful, um, but which doesn't get in the way of creativity. So I focus on the organization. It's our team. It's uh, the business side of things. It's about the facilities that we work with. So the computers that we're we're working on or the IT that gets it all working and really my job is to allow people like Natalie and CJ to do what they do best to make the most amazing game ever and um, I have a, a biggish team um, I have people who only focus on the office or only focus on IT or only focus on the business numbers um, and although we're not creatives in our own role we do creative things in what we do uh, we're still really, really important for making games. So in other words, if you're not an artist or you're not a coder, still lots of roles in studio. The most important job that I do is pull the people together, try and get the right people in the studio and working in the right way. And it's about high performance, just like if you're playing in a sports team or you're um, studying for your A-levels. You want to be at your peak at the moment when you take those exams. We, we want our team members to be really enjoying what they do, really passionate about what they do uh, and, and being very productive. Um, so, uh, you know, there's lots of ways of helping that out, but a lot of it is getting the right people. So I'm involved in hiring or getting rid of people and responsible for salaries and benefits and training. Um, and we work on the culture. You know, it's really important how we do things. Um, so the six people that look like playing cards in the middle are all members of our social committee. So they organize a lot of events and activities. Um, you can see that, you know, we, we go out and have dinner together or have drinks 
Um, and as part of my job, I also have a um, duty of care. I've got to make sure the office is safe, that the team members are safe with COVID. We've got lots of um, ways of stopping people coming into the studio and working from home. So I'm just going to pause and talk about our studio so you get a sense of the size of the place. Just quickly run through these here. Um, so we're about 200 people. When we are in the studio, we're based in Stratford in East London, right by the uh, West Ham Football Stadium at the Olympic Park. And um, we have about 150 people who are full time, so they are permanent. And then we have about 50 fixed term contractors. So they might be in for the season. So they'll come work from, say, July to December um, or their contractors. And sometimes this is because the contractor has a very specific skill um, and they want to work for many people, not just one. Um, we have been hiring during lockdown. So we, we roughly hire one a week. It seems to be the ratio at the moment. Um, and the games industry at the moment is hiring lots of roles. Um, it's, it's a growth industry. There is a shortage of skills in the UK. So um, doing the right subjects will, will definitely lead to a role. Um, our studio is very cosmopolitan, like football is a global passion and people in Italy, in Spain, in you know Thailand, in Argentina, they love football as much as the uh, British people do. And to reflect that cosmopolitan view of football, it's good for us to have team members from around the world in, in the studio. So if you come into the studio, you'll hear different accents, different languages, um, and you can find out a lot about other people's uh, backgrounds and interests and even in the way that they support and, and, and watch football. Um, we were very lucky at lockdown um, in that we already had some remote working and we had set up systems and tools to get the jobs done um, to support off, offline working. So um, today, about a quarter of the studio are permanently outside of, of London um, right around the world. I've put some countries up here. Um, and so again, you know, you're working with really interesting people. Um, we have lots of people in the studio that have been with us a long time. So a third about 10 years and a third about two years or under. And probably the weakest thing about the studio right now is our gender diversity. It seems really, really hard to persuade women to look at careers in technology and in gaming in particular, but particularly with our studio, because we also have football, um, it's, it's a certain person who, who will be interested in that. But we are really you know, keen to change this. And this is something I'm embarrassed about and want to really work on getting to much more proportionate workplace. Um, our studio um, is who works in the office and sort of works on the code, but um, we have a network of nearly a thousand people who help us collect data on the football industry. Um, and they're overseen by 95 people who are called heads of research. And these guys are going to football games. They're watching um, the juniors, the under 18s, the under 23s. They're going to all the matches. They're following all the social media of the players and they're writing up about their experience of football and we'll try and capture that in the game. And then I mentioned that the studio was owned by Sega. Sega themselves are based in Brentford and West London. They have about 300 people in their building of which about 60 work directly with us and they might be in lawyers or accountants in the sales team. They might do our web design or acquire the licenses from football clubs. So a lot of jobs exist in uh, the publisher as well as in the studio. Big part of my job is, is tracking the money. So what we spend our money on. Um, so to give you an idea, you know, our studio is probably spending something like 15 to 16 million pounds a year. So that's how much it costs to keep this, this uh, office running. And that needs people to be raising purchase orders and checking out the contracts with all the partners. There's a lot of detail in there. And of course, you can't spend money uh, how you like. Someone's always got to approve it and there's got to be someone to see it. So we do a lot of accounting and forecasting. We also are able to take advantage of the UK's um, government gives a tax credit for making games. 
so someone's got to apply for that and put in the paperwork so a lot of administration roles in in an operation side so um i mentioned we work in here east this is a picture of the outside of our office on the bottom left there we're actually on the top floor on the right hand side there on that glass frontage um so it's it's a really modern site um, the middle picture shows you our, our context. So you'll see the Olympic Stadium uh, across the way from us. Um, we're literally across the way from the Copper Box, which is where the London basketball team plays, um, and lots of green space and a canal and a river, and it's, it's really beautiful. And we're very lucky because on the same site, there are a couple of universities. There's Loughborough, there's Stafford have got their London Digital Institute where they're teaching about esports. Um, and Liverpool have just opened up their arts and media um, London campus. So uh, they do musical theatre and digital film. So there's lots of young people. It's a really vibrant environment. It's fun. It's a good place to be. Um, and because you can't visit the studio and see it, which I'd love you to do, I've got some pictures just to show you, OK, so what's it like working here? So this is our front entrance with a, an array of awards that studio has won. Uh, and this is the floor. And what you'll notice, hopefully, is it's all in one room. Everyone works together. That's what's known as open plan. Um, we're looking over the shoulder here on a couple of the team members. And hopefully what you'll notice is they've got at least two monitors or two devices at any one time. They're, they're checking things through. Um, you can see that um, there's a lot of light. You know, we, we work in an environment that um, you want people to be awake and, and, and going on. Um, I'm going to show a few more. So just further down, you'll notice some TV screens now. So we have our own internal TV um, programming where we talk about uh, our team or what's going on, um, what's, uh, what social club is doing that evening, what the menu is, uh, what what cafes are open on the square outside, um, but also data from the game, how many people are playing, where are the areas that are going well. Um, here's another picture of a desk I wanted to show you. People can put their toys on their desk. This person has three monitors because they're not happy with two. Um, you can see a whiteboard in the background with some post-it notes that's a bit of game flow or UI UX. Uh, and again, watching you know what's going on in football out the window. And just outside the window there, you can see the copper box on the far side of the car park there. Um, people can move around the studio. They do have their own desk, but we have lots of spaces where they can collaborate with people or have stand up desks here. And uh, this is our kitchen by day and sports bar by evening. Um, we have a big screen where we do all our team meetings in this room. Um, but we also, you know, we watch football. We watch the midweek football. Um, we do events in here and we host a uh, number of events, we have talkers come and talk about their careers or what they're working on. Um, and we often open that up to externals like students such as yourself. So many, many other game studios also do that. Um, so if you're into uh, getting out and about when COVID uh, subsides, uh, that's something that most studios do. And this is what it looks like when it's full and people are drinking. Um, the social side of any game studio is really important. Uh, we work hard, we play hard, we spend a lot of time together and um, we try and have a lot of fun. So people will do um, d d club or board games in the evening as much as we might watch sport. Um, shout out to our IT department. So to have 200 people who are very good at making games, you need a really good IT department. Um, we have an apprenticeship scheme that comes through there. We've also got uh, people who retrain that come through this department. Um, so that's something that I think we're pretty proud of. Um, and this is a press day. So this is before we've released the product. We've invited some um, social uh, media, some YouTubers in, some um, uh, journalists, and they get uh, hands on with an early build of, of the product. And what you can see, this is one of our meeting rooms. So you can see some of the kits on the wall. Uh, and then we go. So let's just to give you an idea of the environment. Many young people that I talk to, you know, they have no idea of what's really available, what jobs there are. And um, I kind of tie up jobs with with personalities. You know, if you're into certain things, um, certain jobs are going to be better for you. But we have literally dozens and dozens of different types of jobs that happen in our studio. 
Uh, and the most difficult thing actually is getting us all to work together. We're really, really good as individuals. We're really good at a particular specialism, but the magic in making games is being able to combine those talents and, and make a team work really well. Um, so I've listed a whole bunch of things here. I'm not going to spend that much time on it, but I do want to make a difference between the creatives or the creators on the left-hand side, which also include economists who've got to balance game economies and psychologists who have to make sure that, you know, player needs are being addressed in the game design. Um, but, you know, these are very typically these are more technical, very specialist um, I've put localization in there, so language speakers um, or coders. Um, but if that's not your thing, there's still lots and lots of jobs in the games industry that you might be good at. I find that really talkative, charming, engaging people, you know, they might work well in sales and they might work well in PR. And one of the beauties of games is, you know, if you love games and you're passionate about them, why not sell them? Why not PR them? So there can often be um, those types of roles where you don't think about it. Um, if you're a little bit more introverted, a little bit more quieter, a bit more mathematics, maybe a bit more analytic, um, you know, we, we have three or four people who are dedicated to looking at the data that comes from the games, writing reports uh, and quietly sharing it. They, they don't particularly like presenting. That's not their thing. But, you know, their passion drives them to a place where we can actually fit them in the studio as well. So at this stage, I'm going to hand over to one of our doers, um, which is Natalie, and let her take over. Thanks, Matt. Um, hey, guys. So I'm Natalie. I'm 29. Unlike Matt, I do not have children, but I do have my scaly baby, um, Naga the snake. I was born in Australia, um, but the reason I can live over here is that my mum was born here in Derby. So I have a weird accent, but I'm allowed to be here. Um, so my pathway to games was I studied information technology and video games at Bond University in Australia. Initially, I wanted to be a game designer, but um, then I decided to take a gap year and come to Europe just to see what happened. Um, ended up working as a media booking assistant just to make some money. And then I kind of got sucked into the world of planning, scheduling, structuring, um, but I always wanted to work in games and an opportunity came up for me to work as a games producer, which was super exciting. I did that for a little while. And then um, a little while ago, about 2016, virtual reality and augmented reality got really big. Um, and I was really excited about those fields. So I moved across into working on a bunch of different um, experiences, including virtual reality or augmented reality for different advertising companies. And then I did that for four years and more recently I've come back to my first love of games development here at Sports Interactive. Um, so I will tell you guys a little bit about what is a producer. Um, so I'm the senior producer for art and animation at Sports Interactive but there's a bunch of different producers at Sports Interactive that do all sorts of different things. Um, the title is not the musical kind so we share that with the film industry and the music industry but in the case of software development, it does mean something really different. Um, I like to explain this position as a cat herder. So if you imagine trying to get a group of cats all going in the same direction, all focused, um, despite any distractions, despite their different motivations or their unique personalities, and you've got to be able to quickly change your focus and keep your eyes on a lot of different things at once. You've got to be persuasive without being demanding, and you've got to always keep the end goal in mind. Um, so producers are responsible for owning the product's vision. So this means you're responsible for knowing what the team is making, who they're making it for, why they're making it, how it should look, how it should feel, and how it should work. So if anybody has any questions, you're the person they're going to ask them. You might not know the exact answer straight away, but you should always know who to find that information from. So you're the, the glue that keeps everyone together. Um, yeah, so you, again, you don't have to know all the details of how everything works because you have a team of experts that are working with you. These are the developers, the artists, um, the designers. These guys come up with all the ideas and you just have to remember who's doing what and what they're working on. Um, you'll also need to be able to explain the goals of the product to those people. 
and then the outcomes of the product to stakeholders, which might be clients or people, other people within the company and the end users. Um, you'll be herding those cats. So working with the stakeholders to get the deadlines, working with your team to determine which features are possible within those timelines, building schedules, um, whether that's, oh, and tracking progress. Um, the responsibility for keeping the team on target lies with the producer. So if things are getting stuck or they're not working properly, then you need to have a backup plan. Um, so as the speaker for the team, it's the producer's role to protect the team from ad hoc requests or to protect stakeholders from jargon. Um, so what can happen in some cases is that stakeholders will have a great idea and they really, really, really want to get it into the game. Um, if that person was to go directly to someone in your team, they might distract them and they end up you know, working on this, this great idea but not getting their stuff done, which can mess with the schedule. Um, the other way around, you know, your team might have finished their feature and they're really excited about it. And if they go directly to the stakeholders, they might not be explaining it in a really succinct way that's useful for that person to understand. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's your job to make sure that all of these good ideas coming in are in a way that's easy for your team to understand and all of the updates going out are in a way that's easy for stakeholders to understand. Producers from different companies might be responsible for the whole product, so the entire game, or for a set of features from the game, or for a team. So in my case, I'm responsible for an art team, but I can also take on additional features. So if there's a new feature coming into the game and they need someone to look after it, I might take that and chat to the other producers to make sure that all of our teams are working on this feature, but at the same time, I'm looking after my team and the features that live in that. Um, and so my tips for becoming a game maker. If you want to get into this industry, oh gosh, sorry about that, guys. <laughs> uh, if you want to get into this industry, you need to show it. So whether you want to be a producer, a designer, a developer, an artist, whatever it is, find ways to showcase your talents. So look for game jams that you can get involved in, either through your school, online, or get your own group together and set a mini challenge. You can write a blog about your experiences. Remember to be professional and educational, and then people are going to want to read it. Um, if you're really short for ideas on things you can do to build your portfolio, one thing that I always recommend is to find a brand or a company you like and then make something for them as if you had an internship. Um, so for instance, do you really like Pokemon? I love Pokemon. So a task that I might set for myself if I was a designer would be to come up with some improvements on their battling system that I think they should do in their games. And then I could write that up like a really professional design document and put that in my portfolio. It didn't go in the game and nobody's used it, but it shows off my work and how I can do it. If I was an artist, I might design them a new Pokemon. So sketch it up, make sure that it matches, draw it in a sprite format, in a 2D render. Maybe if I'm particularly good, I'll do it as a 3D character that spins around and animates. Um, again, it's not for the company, it's just a portfolio piece. So make sure if it's, if you are using these ideas that you credit the original owner of the idea. So in this case, this is inspired by the Pokemon company, but I'm not affiliated with them. So you want to make that clear so that you're not using anybody else's intellectual property. Um, and if you're not a gamer, you can still do this. Set yourself a project that's going to test your skills and showcase them for whatever it might be. You should also find yourself a support group. Um, so I'm on some Facebook groups called Women in Immersive Tech and Women in Product. This are obviously not gonna suit all of you guys, but find your group and join them. Um, these support groups are really helpful. They help you find out about upcoming jobs, sharing new ideas. And sometimes it's nice just to have people in your same situation that you can chat to. Um, if you can't find anything like that or you're not interested in those groups, forums are a great place as well. So for instance, if you wanna be a Unity developer, their forums are fantastic to bounce ideas off or get people to check your code. Um, and then finally, some production tools I think everybody should get familiar with. So Trello is a great free tool. I recommend you start using it now for group projects at school or your own personal to-do list. It'll let you get familiar with something called a Kanban board, which is just a series of columns that you can group your tasks by. Oh, 
<laughs> Someone's microphone there. Um, many smaller companies use Trello and getting familiar with tracking tasks in this format is going to be helpful for using other similar tools as well. Um, Jira, very similar, but it's a lot more versatile um, and it's a lot harder to get into at first. So if you are interested in digging deep into Jira, I highly recommend you look on YouTube and some tutorials first um, before you try a free trial. Microsoft Project is a little bit more old school. Um, it's another incredibly versatile tool and it combines task tracking with longer term, you know, planning. Um, another tool is TeamGAN. So this is free as well. And it lets you plan out a project using a Gantt chart. I'm not gonna go into that because there's so much, um, but basically it's like a calendar view of your tasks. So if you're working on a group project and you know that you need to finish task A and task B before you can start task C, you can map that out with a Gantt chart. So they're really cool. And then Google and Microsoft, I mean, you guys go to school, I'm sure you know how to use these online tools. Um, but getting familiar with word processing, um, with some sort of spreadsheet technology and with a PowerPoint technology is going to be super useful for your professional career, whatever it is. Um, especially spreadsheets, I find really useful. Try and learn some formulas and shortcuts and things that make things faster um, and it'll really help you out. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Natalie. So I'm now going to introduce you to CJ. Thank you, Natalie. Um, and thanks again, Matt. Um, myself, CJ, I'm 28 years old. I was born, born and raised in London, West London to be exact. And I've been a lifelong Arsenal fan, which kind of makes my pathway into football and then later gaming. I'm sorry, Matt. Um, ideal for me, really. And um, some interesting context, which I didn't realise until I'd done this, is I've actually been playing the football manager game for 14 years. So to come off the back of what Natalie said about coming up with an idea of a company that you're a fan of, that you can have a proposal for, it's almost what I did in my interview for Football Manager after playing for so long. I had such an insight in the game. I was, I was a big fan. And from my history, which I'll go through now, I feel it's a lot more important to try and work for companies that you're passionate about or that you feel like you you can fit in in terms of the kind of products they make or the games they make, whichever it is, rather than just going for somewhere that you might not have that same passion for. So my pathway into gaming was quite different from the normal pathway. If anyone's really good at maths, they can do the maths and realise I didn't go to uni and I went straight out of college into a football coaching job at Arsenal Football Club because I had a I had a dream of working in football and I had a dream of working as a football coach. Um, I did that for two, two and a half to three years. And then I realised maybe long term, this isn't for me. And this is something that you might find as well when you get older. What you wanted to do and what you're passionate for isn't actually what you want to do long term because it doesn't always work out like that. So my plan was how can I use the skills that I've, I've built up? So I was a football coach. I worked with young people. How can I use those skills and transfer them into something else I wanted to do? So one of the, one of the key things which you're probably already picking up even at this age and even at school is transferable skills and how they can be used to um, just put you in a position to apply for another job or another role that you might not have done. So if you just look at what I did, I was a football coach. And that was the only working experience I really had. And I managed to cross over from football coaching into um, being a data analyst for a company called Opta. They work on uh, anyone who's a football fan, they'll be familiar with them. They're the people that put all the stats on the screen and count all the live stats. I was literally watching live football and logging every pass and shot as it happened, which is in hindsight, really hard work. But at the time I loved it and I was happy to be involved in an industry I wanted to be in and then by chance I happened to meet the football manager staff at a networking event which I'll touch on a little bit later but um, I just almost like Matt said for himself as well I kind of fell into gaming and all my past experience which I'd built up over the years of football coaching and tactics and understanding how data works that was perfect for a role at football manager doing QA so I started in the gaming industry in 2016, working for Football Manager, just as an entry-level QA tester. I was, I was here for 18 months. 
Then from that, I eventually got to tick off another childhood dream and work for Rockstar Games, who you're all too young to actually play their games. So I hope none of you are playing Grand Theft Auto. But it's it's um, a pretty big game. And it was one that I really wanted to tick off my, my list. I didn't expect it to happen so early, but sometimes you just take the opportunities. And then I was there for half a year. And then I came back to Sports Interactive as a QA lead, which I'll explain in the next slide. So what is QA? Usually I just tell people I'm a game tester, but the official term for it is QA, quality assurance, which means we have to check that the product is quality, quality it's working correctly, and it's everything you kind of imagine a game tester to be, but also the boring bits as well. So you're doing all the fun stuff like testing the game, making sure there's no obvious errors, and there's all sorts of different ways you can test games and it does depend on what type of game that you're you're testing so for instance testing football manager with all the detail and all the tactics that go into it it's really really different to testing an open world game like grand theft auto or red dead redemption so um you do have to be conscious of what kind of game you'll be testing because it might not always fit what you enjoy from gaming or what you can get the most out of um, the four main groups of testing, I would say, to put it into some context, is playthrough testing, where you just play the game the same way somebody who bought the game would. And it's usually to see if the game's too fun, not too fun, or too easy, or fun enough, or just enjoyable in general. And then another way of testing um, is test plan testing. So the QA lead would put together some organized plans for the testers to go through, and it would be a lot of um, box ticking and does this work does this menu work does this screen work which can get repetitive but it's also really important um you have my favorite type of testing which is destructive testing where you just play the game in a completely unrealistic way you try and break things you try and just do all the weird things on a game that shouldn't be done and just make sure that the game can handle what somebody could do in the real world and lastly we got group testing so this was something well I didn't invent it but I brought it to my team at Sports Interactive where we get the QA and the developers all together in the same call and we all go through different bugs or different um, issues in the game and we'll just work with them directly with the developers because how QA usually works is the testers will log bugs it gets sent to developers, developers fix them, send them back to QA, then QA test them to see if they've been fixed. With this, where we're all together in the same call, we can get fixes instantly at times. And it's it's shown to be really um, productive and a really good way to test. And the QA lead basically organizes everything I just explained. Um, how to get into QA work. So, from my experience, the best way is through networking. Um, Natalie touched on game jams as well. They were something I was a bit late to the party with, but it seems that young people are a lot more on it than I was. And they, they're a brilliant way to meet people that are like-minded, want to get into gaming, give you new ideas and new new creative, um, just new creative ways to plan. I actually went to a board game, game jam once, which I didn't expect to find interesting. I kind of just went as a friend told me it would be a good idea but I'd recommend always take every opportunity to network or learn or develop that um that board game um event it was actually hosted by Sony but I had no idea so I ended up making some cool contacts at PlayStation and meeting all these interesting people for something I never thought I would be interested in myself so I would recommend you always take um any opportunity that comes up even if you think it might not apply to you um, there's lots of gaming networks. Natalie touched on one for women. I work for Baming Games, so that's Black and Minority Ethnics. Um, it's it's inclusive to everybody, so you don't just have to be um, Black or Minority Ethnic to attend their events. But their events are, are brilliant, and I don't just say that because I've worked with them. It's really good to get people involved, and you meet so many people and so many like-minded people. And I'd say over 50% of people that attend these type of events have no job in gaming and their their intention is to try and get into the industry. So don't don't ever feel that you're too inexperienced to go to something like this or go to any sort of networking event because it's more aimed at people that don't have the experience. Um, as I said before, find companies you're passionate about. 
I don't feel like it's a coincidence. I ended up at Football Manager. I've been a fan of the game since 14 years old. So naturally, I was going to end up doing something I enjoy and I love. And kind of when I broke down my career path is highlight your transferable skills. So when I moved out of football coaching into game development and they asked me, what do you know about gaming? I said, I'm very good at organising time. I'm very good at working with people. I can work in groups. I can organise. And all the things that I would have done in other jobs, I just brought it over to this because you'll realise as you go through as you go through life and even in lessons, things you learn in science might be applicable to maths. And that's just generally how life works. And lastly, um, social media. I'm sure a lot of you are quite up to date on social media, but create a profile for yourself to show your work. Um, again, like Natalie said, same advice. What she, the example she gave was actually a brilliant example, which I'll, I'll back up and just plus one on. Find a company or something you're really passionate about and then just give reasons and ways you can improve it or ways it can develop or grow in whichever way, whichever social strengths. Um, but it's a very, very good thing to do. And it's something that companies are quite impressed at. And lastly, I'm not sure about the age, but LinkedIn, even though I like to call it boring Facebook, it's actually a very good tool for networking and finding people and just looking for jobs in general. It's it's come up for me loads of times and it's been really good in the past for me so it's something that I would definitely recommend. Thank you CJ. Um, I've got a few more slides but I'll go very quick because I know we're, we're running up against time but keep on the theme about how do you get a job in the games industry I've got my own checklist as well. Um, CJ and, and Natalie both talked about turning up to game jams or doing things but essentially being proactive is the key. Um, I think we'll all agree that we were very lucky with how we fell into the jobs that we love, um, but you make your luck. You, you, you're in the right place at the right time when the right person walks in the room and you have that lucky conversation. So make yourself lucky, get out there, be brave, be bold, no matter how shy you are, um, it is worth it. Uh, LinkedIn, when I talk to young people, I often get a strange look uh, on LinkedIn, but you need to check it out because every single job in the games industry is posted on there. And it's really easy to follow the games companies that you might like uh, and to learn about them. And that will always make it easier for you to apply or if, if you're lucky enough to get an interview to be able to talk about it. So do your research. Um, like Natalie, I would recommend if you're not an artist, um, and you're not a planner, what I recommend is that you write game reviews. And if you play a breadth of games and you get into the habit of writing what's good, what's bad, and what you would do to make the game better, you'll quickly pick up a, a language that you can talk with when you go for interviews. And you can give really good examples about how you might solve a problem. And then I know many of you will be talking about work experience as part of school, um, I can't um, stress enough that you need to walk into different businesses and you shouldn't expect that it, it's work experience. It's about shadowing. It's about watching how a business works. Uh, I've got a slide about that. And the last thing is you should all do some basic coding. Even if you don't become a coder, it's helpful to know how to work with coders and to, to understand how they see the world. Um, and you know what? If you do become even halfway uh, decent coder you'll be able to check their work and and kind of you know take things forward um, so no no small amount of code is too little um, most companies post their jobs we do too that's what it'll look like um, there's loads of resources out there um, yuki i mentioned right at the start is a really good starting place um, but there's lots of events, as, as um, Natalie and CJ talked about. I used LinkedIn to follow companies so that I can see what they're up to. Um, there is a very nice tool, which I think you can link to from Yuki website, which is a map of all the educational courses that might have something to do with games. Um, so if you are interested in further education, um, there are formal courses all over London. There's also courses that you can work on from home. So if you decide not to go down an academic route, um, train to game or 
video games courses uh, or online courses. And people like Unity, people like Google, they have their own little courses that they can teach you uh, the basic skills that might get you going. Just a line on work shadowing or work experience. Um, this little picture here, I was reminded, Brandon on the left came from the Aspire program uh, back in February half term when we were still open. Um, we and all games companies take work experience on. Um, and just as a bit of, of a point of view on this, um, it, it can be really tiring, you know, turning up and listening all day long from nine till five, adult talk, things you don't understand, a lot of jargon. Um, it, it can be tough work, but it is really worth it. My recommendation is to get as much different experience as you can. So better to go to two placements in two weeks than one placement for two weeks um, and better to go for a day than, than not to go at all. So even if you can't get a week's work shadowing or experience, ask for a day or ask for an afternoon. Um, writing to get your um, uh, placement is like writing for a job. Um, so it's a good practice for writing those persuasive letters doing your research as to who you should send it to. Um, and why it's really invaluable is when you're in the studio or at a workplace, um, if you're brave and you ask people to have a cup of tea with you, you can find out how they got on and they'll give you lots of short tips, uh, shortcuts and tips to getting on. Uh, and I have a few here. So pen and paper for everything, write everything down, um, watch people, how do they speak, what decisions get made, ask questions, smile people like people who smile um, and ask those those cups of coffees or tea to find out more um, we mentioned about applying for you know jobs and internships you'll all be thinking about this um, you got to write with passion you've got to care about the job that you're going to go for um, but you have to expect not to get it there's a lot of competition and you need to stand out so how can you make your letter stand out how can you make your CV stand out? Um, and you have to do a lot. You know, I, I reckon that it's, you know, I say to my kids, you know, you've got to do 50, 100 applications to get to where you want to go. And the bolder you are, the braver you are, the cheekier you can be, the better chance you'll stand out, get noticed and be engaged. Um, so have a look at what you're sending and think of how you can do it. I hired someone many years ago who took a drew a screenshot didn't even grab it he drew it and he wrote about the game that he loved and I thought this this person's really interesting I want to meet them and when I met them he was so enthusiastic that we hired them and um, he went on to become the senior marketing person at Moshi Monsters um, he made so much money and retired and is independently wealthy uh, and I remember him as an 18 year old applying with screenshot that he drew himself. So it, anything can happen. You just got to be really lucky and be brave to do that. Um, uh, CJ talked about QA. Uh, QA is often the place where people can enter the games industry. Um, however much CJ was smiling, he, he's not letting on that it can be really hard. It's a difficult job. Uh, you've got to have excellent attention to detail. You've got to care. So you've got to get into the detail and make it good. Um, but in our studio, QA is often a stepping stone to other passions. So we might take on a QA with an art and animation background who's looking at, for example, the shaders uh, or the lighting or the grass or the kit colours. Um, and, and ultimately what they want to do is make those, those tools uh, and build the product. So... Um, combining QA with other skills can lead to other places. Um, and we have people who, who um, started in QA, watched the coders, never really coded themselves, but watched them thought, oh, I like the look of that. I think I can do that. They've gone on to do courses in their spare time. We've then funded them to get more serious courses. And they've joined us as coders. And I've seen them progress up to senior level within five to seven years, very senior roles doing really complicated coding. So it's really down to you to make that decision that you want to do that. And if you want to do it, you can do it. You just got to kind of take that initiative and make it happen. And that was my last slide. So I'm now gonna exit and we can try and do, let's see if I know how to exit here. Am I off screen? Can't tell, no, I'm not, stop share, there we go.
Thanks so much, Matt and Natalie and CJ. Um, and I've had a question already asking if they if we can share the slides. And I think we we did do that, didn't we, Matt, last time? And yeah, I have no problem with it if you're happy to. Okay, thank you very much. So, has anyone got any questions? If they want to type them in the, the question box, that would be great. 